Listen, I am so happy to be joined by some veterans of this podcast, friends of the podcast, some people that we have interviewed in the past. Uh, Miss Sonia, are you ready? I'm ready. Mr. Zone 3AB, are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> All right, well, let's get into it. Urban Christian Veterans provides a safe place for Christian veterans of color to discuss the challenges you face in your daily lives. Being a person of color has its challenges. Being a Christian has its challenges. Being a veteran has its challenges. All of those factors being combined makes for a unique and sometimes difficult life experience that is seldom talked about in public forums. Thank you for tuning in to the Urban Christian Veterans Podcast. Here's your host, D. Allen Rose. Thank you, Aaron, for that wonderful introduction. This is D. Allen Rose, and you are listening to the Urban Christian Veterans Podcast. Well, first and foremost, let me just say thank you guys so much for coming back. Uh, something must have went right before for you to come back, and I appreciate that. Um, and I know that you guys are busy. So this being our first roundtable, I am so happy that you chose to participate in this. So thank you, first and foremost. And um, for today's discussion, again, this is not an interview. This is a roundtable discussion. Uh, the topic that we're going to tackle today are challenges that veterans of color face in society. Challenges that veterans of color face in society. So if I throw that out there as a, as a topic, what are some of the first things that come to mind? We're oftentimes uh, dismissed at the description or discussion of the very same symptom that veteran B might have. I believe that it takes us a little more to, to get out the gate with the benefit of the doubt afforded that our symptoms are like our counterpart symptoms and uh, we should receive the same benefit of the doubt at our intake level. Oftentimes I think that we get more red tape before we get to go past go than our counterparts do. Okay, so you're talking more from a, a medical perspective then? M medical um, benefits, we don't have the same information oftentimes that others are privy to. So there are veterans of color that aren't even capitalizing utilizing benefits that are just kind of known and shared and distributed with our counterparts. Okay. You see how like minds think though. <laughs> so to, exp to expand on what Sonya was saying, you know, I call it, what she was talking about is, is spot on. What I call it discrimination through dissemination. There you go. So we're discriminated on based on a lot of times just the information, how it comes out, how it's spread. It. Uh, we get it late a lot. And when we get it, we don't have the correct way to go about it. And a lot of times we're scrambling to look for ways to deal with it, resources to tackle it. When a lot of times the way it comes to some others, it, it's, it's in a package with a bow on it. Mm -hmm. You do it this way. You, you, you take, you take, le you, you take Main Street, and go to go to Baker Street and you're gonna be there. You know, they tell us first of all, uh, you know, hey, well, uh, how you gonna get there if we get to you? We get information. <laughs> Don't worry about that. I get a, get away. So yeah, so to me it's it's this it's discrimination through dissemination that I that's that's what I like to call it. Why do you but uh she was spot on with it. Why do y'all think that is? Well oh. I it's no different than the everyday world we live in. Uh right. if if we could answer this question for the military, we can go fix all of America. Mm. Exactly. Um, the, 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 the rules of engagements, one, have never been equally shared. Our path has always been the long way around the Marbury Bush. Um, you know, we won't even talk about how long it took the emancipation just to get to Texas and we were free how long? So, again, we've always operated in inequitable capacities which means oftentimes we don't always get the fair shake. Example, you've got two military members, and let me step out even military members who've gone on to join, say, the fire department. Why are there class action suits? Because 
you've got two equally qualified candidates, but the white counterparts pull ahead and their promotion rate exceeds ours, say uh, nine to one. For every one black officer, you've already got nine white counterparts filling in that capacity. So why is there such an equity in the 21st century? And I would add to that by saying, if you're talking about uh, minorities in the uh, military, you're talking about, as far as veterans, you're talking about 23% minorities. When you're talking about veterans of color, now you're talking about 12%. Mm -hmm. So 12% of the armed forces veterans, that's a small group. So when you have such a small group, you know, and the VA has put out things. I mean, the White House has this, uh, for every every agency they have, what they kind of try to do is they call it their e equitable tolling, their footing. So they try to make sure each agency has a plan. How do you combat this this gap? How do you close the gap for this marginalized group of people? So the information is there. But even with that information, who knows about it? What purpose does it serve? And is it actually getting to me? So you have this group of people that's paid to, to try to close that gap on that 12 percent to bring them closer to, you know, so they're not so marginalized. But you really don't feel that effect. You know, because there are so many other things the VA has to do and they, they, they hire only one or two people to try to close that gap. So I think that there's not enough people uh, that the VA hire to fill that void to make sure that 12 percent of people of veterans of color, not that marginalized and that we have the right information. We know how to go at certain processes inside of that organization or, or that department. So my answer would be, hey, I don't want to say they don't care. I just said that they go about it in the same slow manner as they do everything in life with people of color. And oftentimes the people that they're bringing in to address and fix the problem are not people of color. Right. So mm. someone who is not of color cannot champion an initiative about a, a known problem, lifelong problem for people of color. Right. Why would they? Well, exactly. No, that's a good point. I think I was going to say I'll, I'm going to play devil's advocate, but I don't I don't even want to call it that. I want to say through through my experiences, what I've seen is that some of that issue that you talk about, while it may be discrimination through dissemination, at the same time, there there may be some instances of self-inflicted wounds, meaning when the information is presented and disseminated correctly, sometimes we have a tendency to not do the right thing with it. So have you ever experienced that? Absolutely. You know, there's always going to have some that are, just don't have do right in them. <laughs> you know, right. do right sometimes have been our biggest failure to ourselves. If the rule requires that you do X, Y, and Z, you can't just do X and Z and then call foul. We always being left out. So I do believe that there's ownership on that side of the coin that even going to the table, knowing that we are op operating from a deficit, I think our character has been the thing that's always set us apart, that's allowed us to prevail, even when the deck was stacked against us. I just believe you do the right thing, of course. The light will show up on th those landmines that are sometimes planted for us. Uh, with full intentions of our failure. You know, on both sides, you're going to have people that will cut corners. But when uh, we're doing the right thing, I think the right thing needs to be rewarded. That's where the frustration comes in. You follow the rules, um, you show up, uh, good intentions, and somehow, instead of getting the 100% that we're entitled, we got to start at 75 and then earn that remaining 25 and jump through all the additional hoops that our counterparts aren't required to do. Yes, and uh, my, my play off that, and I don't want to get too deep in the weeds now. I know you said this. We could have this weed <laughs> conversation, but you know, down there. But my, but but this is my thing. Uh, it used to bother me. I used to, you know, we had a conversation. You know, our last conversation. You know, we talked about a lot of different things. But one thing that's always bothered me was uh, fear mentality versus house mentality. Mm -hmm. So what I had to learn, and I learned it through just, I guess, everything that's been going on for these last few years. What I've learned is, uh, so my interpretation of, I used to did not understand house mentality. 
And house mentality to me is uh, the difference is understanding attrition through warfare and attrition through warfare is mostly the survival of the fittest. You know, so that means, hey, I'm going to get out there and get mine. I'm going to get it. I'm going to make sure I get the right information. I'm going to get whatever I need by any means necessary. Well, that, that may not be the, the way I like to go at things, but to me, house mentality is is exactly that is attrition through warfare. Fear mentality is is what I like to call uh, affliction through warfare. So affliction through warfare, it, it's hard to fix because there's always this preconceived notion, this 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 genocidal effect of, of, of them steering. And I, I know what you're going to say, who is them? But, you know, when, when we're steered a certain way and, and our behavior has been that for so long, now when we come to, you know, rectifying certain things, I, I don't care. Even when they disseminate the information, we're so afflicted by the things that has happened when we when it's when it's a way for us to get it and i think this is i'm trying to play into what you were saying a lot of times we get in our own way yeah. you know we get in our own way we don't we don't we don't trust we only trust certain processes even through lack of research the, the information can be there but but it may require something and and, and a lot of times you know we we like we talked about we will do the hookups we'll do the little small hookups you know give me the hookup uh do it for me Tell me how I can get it. When it comes down to, to 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 championing your own process and making sure everything works well for you, I think that sometimes we hide behind that affliction, you know, the way it was dealt. So to me, I just say you're not gonna have a level playing field, and 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 you have to be you have to be somebody that has has a mindset to 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 get out and champion your own situation. And a lot of veterans I see of color just won't do it. You know, that, that's just my take. You know, I may be wrong. You know, I, I hope that this can change, but because of what I do and me trying to take care of veterans the way I take care of them, I see it every day. Uh, just talking to veterans, listening to veterans, it's a big disconnect. It's a problem. You know, a lot of times they'll rather go see somebody else than to have a conversation with me about it because of whatever reason. And that's why so many so, end up in situations. The People who make it easy for you, you best believe their piece of the pie is represented right. on your return. What exactly. you're doing is you're educating in the process. And in educating with the process, you're teaching, which means they got that if they've got to go back in and go for another round. So many veterans, like you say, they want to do the, the shortcuts. Um, and then that's when you get into objective and subjective. If you're going to leave you to chance and allow someone to make the decision about you, and they look at you and they look at a counterpart, you're rated 20%, they come out of the gate right at 80%. You've got to be a stakeholder in your own game. Mm -hmm. And being a stakeholder means you're committed to due process. You can call a thing a thing when it's not due process. You can look at, here are my attempts, here are my efforts. When you're able to put light on a situation, it causes anything not clean, not not legal, not right to scramble because light makes everything stand up right in measurement. Mm. Well, you know, when you talk about the house mentality versus field mentality, the, what immediately what came to mind was there's a feeling of entitlement. Mm. I made it. I got mine. Right. You get yours. And then the thing is that not only do we finally get ours if we do a lot of us do have that that mentality of i made it i got my whatever it is it could be a claim it could be a hundred percent it could be whatever i don't know if you recall sonia but when we used to work together we had many opportunities and we used to take advantage of those opportunities to bring people on who i mean if you if you remember what our organization looked like it looked like united nations right. mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> we had absolutely <laughs> right it, it 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 didn't it didn't all it didn't all look the same. And what right. was an observation of mine was that we would bring people in. And once they came in, they came in and established this. I made it and then wouldn't mm -hmm. reach back and bring others forward. And I think that that is prevalent, not only with when it comes to veterans and claims, but just in general, in society, period. And so I guess the question I mm -hmm. have then is knowing that that exists and that we can sometimes be our own enemy, worst enemy. What would you suggest in terms of trying to turn that corner? Like what what can we do to to make it such that we we normalize reaching back and helping others? I think our the the, the chain link of success that 
our four founders, and I'm talking Big Mom and them, wanting something for yourself was their ticket out. So there was a perseverance in their spirit that we're not going to get a fair shake. We know we're the underdogs. So by whatever means necessary, we, we, we're going to stick together. We're going to teach. We're going to grow together. Somewhere you fast forward along the way, the word entitlement. There was an expectation that then we were owed something. And I believe that during that season of our paradigm shift, we lost sight of what grit and grind mean, that the pie is still there. I'm entitled to it, but I'm not going to be like the man by the well. All you got to do is just <laughs> fall in it. Won't nobody help me. That mentality of, won't nobody help me. Well, help has become interpreted as, no, not help you. No, won't nobody do it mm-hmm. for you. Um, no has never been the, the, the point of acceptance for us as, as a people. You tell us, no, that just means, um, okay, let me explain it to you differently. I don't think you understand me. That drive of, I'm not going to be denied. Somewhere along the way, we've lost that. And entitlement is easy. Uh, grit and grind is, I mean, it's going to be uncomfortable. We don't want to be uncomfortable in our efforts to gain. And un- until some of that is restored in us, there are going to be a lot of us that come up Um, you're going to sit at 50% for a long time. Why? You don't want to go back and do the packet over. You don't want to provide the documentation they're asking you for. When Anthony says, hey, all you got to do is X, Y, and Z, I'm going to get to it. When he sees them months later, did you ever get that turn in? Man, I've been busy. Our priorities are not oftentimes lined up against what the outcome is that we are desiring. Yeah, Yeah, I want to add, and I, I I, I need to do a better job closing that gap. So I said house mentality and fear mentality. That house mentality, again, is to me, the people that they already know how to get it. They know the shortcuts and they're like, I'm going to get it by any means necessary. I don't care if they get it. And for the most part, I'm not trying to help them get it. So that's always been that house mentality, that 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 for self, that fear mentality has been that that war is me and and y'all need to give me this. Y'all owe me this. That's that entitlement phase. To, to where fear mentality always feel entitled to something because they feel somebody left them out. So it's a disconnect. Now, to bridge that, you know, a person has to get to a point of what I call mature mentality, and that's fully developed. That's that's having reached that most advanced stage, you know, and that's that mature mentality to where you say, okay, in my thinking, I know the right things to do, the right processes, or the way I'm going to approach things and do things. It's just having a sound mind about doing things. I, I say the VA, the VA got one thing that when they rate you going in, when you go to the MEP station and, uh, not the VA, I'm sorry, the armed forces, when you sign up for the armed forces uh, and, and, and you raise your hand, they want to know that you, they give you a presumption of soundness unless you sign a waiver. So when you go in, you're a hundred percent whole soldier with no physical ailments unless you sign a waiver. So because you're a hundred percent, they give you that, like I said, presumption of soundness, meaning that you're sound. You are ready to go. There's nothing wrong with you. Now, every time that ailment takes a hit, you get a disability here, something happened here, that's when they start deducting and they say, okay, now you're 10% less of a whole man. You're 20%. Social Security, do, I mean, say Social Security and Workers' Comp do the same thing. But that's why we got these degrees and percentages. So now to just translate this back into the way I view it, when I say mature mentality, we have to get to a point to where we are sound. We, we, we're not too far on this side with our thinking and, and, and rationalization about, and I'm talking about helping people and, and advocating for yourself. Sonia said it best. She said to actually be a stakeholder in your own affairs. And, and I think that that's, that's perfect. When you're a stakeholder in your own affairs, and, and, and you have what I call equitable tolling. You're not too this this way and too this way. You're, 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 you're not so up in the way you don't want to give back and reach back and pull somebody up. And you're not so down to where you're looking for some kind of handout or you're really looking for, you know, somebody to say, hey, well, we owe you something. Even if I, even if they do, you have to get out and, and, and get it and, and manage your process in a way that you know that you are your strongest advocate. And that's the problem I have with a with a lot of veterans. They let the VA, you know, the VA got this, uh, uh, I call it development to deny. You know, they'll go out of their way to develop your case to deny it. So so they get into development to deny all the time. You know, uh, you know, we always say the, the VA is about the delay deny until you die. You know, when I speak to older veterans, you know, they feel like they're caught in that delay to nine until you die, die gap. So it's always you're going to get frustrated. 
and you and you're gonna feel that most of them feel that their process is not worthy of even looking at and, and i just say you know just be sound in sound in mind and know that hey this is what i'm old and and, and and be neutral be mature in your thought process you know hey it's time for me to do it i'm gonna do it this way and i'm gonna seek proper help you know that that's that's me so a lot of this discussion has been centered around claims the va so on and so forth have you ever experienced in a personal relationship where this may have arised and, and, and been an issue for you just early on when i first got back when i first got back from the uh from the gulf war and i had been exposed to so many different things and i didn't know what was going on with me you know i had these uh i think i had a year of swelling where i just would well i started this itching spells first i i itched for about a year or two to where I, it was out of con- uncontrollable then it went to swelling to where I was whelping up. And you're talking about your spouse trying to understand this. And it was so many other things going on with my physical health. You got to understand, I was 18 when I went over there. So you're 18 year old young man or woman, you haven't had time to de- develop these adult things inside of So you know, I'm I'm growing I'm growing overseas. You know, being in war. When I come back, I'm being affected by things that's not resonating with me. I was the health, most healthiest soldier that I knew, but then I come back depleted. I still look physically capable, but I'm going through a lot. So now my wife looked at it like uh, that way. So there were some excuses coming from my way because there were no real answers. So it's like, okay, you look fine. You know, you're going through some kind of identity crisis. I don't even know how to answer that. I don't I don't even know who I am. I don't have a true identity yet. You know, I know who I was when I got back I really don't know who I was you know I'm, I'm trying to develop it so so just going through dealing with trying to ex- explain things that I didn't even have answers for not even knowing what was going on with me and people looking at me in ways to say hey well you know you need to you need to get it together and, and I'm like hey are, are you making excuses and, and I'm like I didn't think I was making excuses I just didn't know what I was going through you know I was trying to develop myself you know I was more of a silly person by nature you know I was one of them like to have fun all the time you know and I got back I still was that person but a lot of it was trying to change because I was trying to become a man you know and I had a family you know a, 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 you know I, I start getting a family now I'm trying to develop this identity but I still got all of this this stuff on me to wear I don't even, I can't even resonate with it because, you know, I don't really know what's going on with me. All I know is I was deployed, I came back, you know, and I don't know that I'm suffering from things that really later only revealed itself, you know, 20 years later, 20, you know, 20, 25 years later. Now I really know, you know, okay, this what was going on. So yeah, I can say with other people, you know, it's just the way they perceive me Some when I was younger and some things I said, it caused a lot of internal strife and conflict. And, and especially in my family with my wife, you know, it was, we had, we had a a lot of it was a lot of growing pains well you know i can relate man or the way that it impacted me mentally was i right. didn't see or i didn't recognize that there was issues with me however others would describe me as antisocial, lame oh he don't like to go out he doesn't like to do this and that and it translated to me being this sort of outcast antisocial, didn't wasn't the guy that right. you really <laughs> wanted to hang out with so i get it i you know That's my personal experience. Uh, And yeah, I I stepped on some toes along the way. So you were already operating under an umbrella that was in place long before you stepped on the stage of the armed forces. The black men particularly already had the chip on their shoulder. So how was the military going to disseminate? Was that a pre-existing chip? Is it a chip we gave them? Uh, Or is this, they're just pissed off people. So uh, again, Communication has not always been our strength. Most of us develop coping mechanisms by shutting down. So it's not the person who's making the most noise. It's that one that's gotten quiet that we should have had our eyes on. The taboo associated with what seeking help meant created an embarrassment or shame or stigma that prompted so many of us not to talk. So it's only gotten better in the most recent years that, oh, let's, let's make self-care and mental health. Let's, let's put it in the open. But just five years ago, people were not addressing, I got some stuff going on inside. Or they were just tagged. No, you don't want to mess with that one. They ain't quite stable. So we've made some strides by getting people to a place that um, something happened to me during my time in the armed forces, but you were almost conditioned not to talk about it. So 
the military, like I said, took 100% of a whole soldier at the time of that swearing in. And in many cases, those soldiers came back 50%, 40% of who they were. And the loved ones around them, the friends, were the ones who actually had the biggest loss. They weren't equipped to be able to address these issues or get to that place inside that veteran that say, what happened? I can remember uncle saying to me, like in Vietnam, no, you just don't talk about it. Right. That was the coping mechanism. But how do you unsee some of what you see? So you can't tell anybody because you're not in the battalion. You're not with, with, with your peers. You're now back with civilian lay people that, one, they couldn't handle it. So you were basically unspokenly conditioned to not talk about the things that had affected you during your time you know, on active it, duty. It took me. Uh, it took me to. I was home when I first started this process uh, of not asking for help with my claims anymore. Before I was accredited, it, it was. Uh, I somehow figured this out on my own. So the first thing I did is I started pulling out all my medical records, my hard copies, to read and say, okay, what are they saying is wrong with me? You know, uh, I've been filing claims because I've, you know, about not been feeling well or this has been going on. But what are they saying? What's in my medical records, actually? Because I really didn't know. And once I started looking, I seen that uh, I was actually a soldier that should have been non-deployable. So I actually found a file that said, hey, it was a question uh, right before we, we were, I was in the reserve. So we were, uh, we were sent to Fort Gordon to mobilize to go to the Gulf War. You know, it was supposed to only be for 90 days. So I got there and I had some things going on. I didn't really know. You know, I just had to go to the doctor a couple of times. And, you know, they told me they'll make a follow up visit with me in uh, the week before I left. We got a call like within that week saying that you guys supposed to have been in country two months ago. And we was leaving in like 24 hours. Get your stuff together. Y'all should have been in Saudi Arabia two months ago. And it was it was coming from uh, that Fulberg Colonel. He was like, hey, y'all need to be here. Y'all get on a plane tomorrow. So I had this doctor that they didn't know if I had scleroderma or, or something going on. I they were they were throwing out some big things because I didn't even know. They just said he got some kind of uh, autoimmune disorder that's setting his system off. Uh, that that it seems like it anyway. And and you know I was supposed to be non deployable. They said you can't deploy a soldier with with that kind of stuff going on. A doctor signed off and said, okay, well. I don't have enough information. Just send them on. They gave me a, a, about 90 days of medication and said, send him, send him in country and, and he'll be back in 90 days and we could revisit this when he get back. All of this is in my medical records. I, I had no idea. And when I got there in 90 days and I ran after 90 days and I ran out of medication because we was there for a year, my system started over overacting. And, you know, I told you, I got to they, they kept me out of the sun because they was like, something's going on with him. They had to protect me because they didn't know. But then on top, you throw anthrax shot on me. And then you give me a nerve agent pill. So my system was going haywire. So by the time I did finally make it home, I, I mean, when I say I used to curl up in a ball, I mean, 100 percent of my hair just fell out. I had so many situations and things going on with me. It was just unexplainable. And my wife was there. You know, she helped me deal with it and did. But, but she didn't know what was going on. You know, and, and like I said, all these different problems that culminated and just hit me. It took me about five years to get over this stuff. I was so depressed. I mean, I couldn't go play ball with my friends. I, was, I, I wasn't I was sleeping. It was just so many unknown. The, the hospitals couldn't tell me. I went to a private doctor. They don't know. The VA said, OK, we, we see this. We'll give you freeze treatments on this. But, you know, it was just it was not really resonating and, you know, I just got so frustrated. Uh, that's when I was at my low where I said that, hey, I was at a point that I could have did something to myself because I was that frustrated and discouraged. Like I said, trying to bring it back. Once I started handling my own process and I started looking at my records and started saying, hey, I didn't know what this was even going on. I didn't know. They even knew it was a problem, but did, did not tell me. So it was more of, like I said, just understanding and not letting somebody just take over your process without you being hands-on. I guess, you know, I'm saying that to say it did sever a lot of relationships with me because some things that I didn't know that was going on with me and, and people looking at me and identifying with me in a certain way. You know, and I, I didn't even want to file a claim. You know, my wife worked at the Shepherd Center and she would, we would pull up and I would be so sick and just, I look at these people get out and I say, you know what, I don't have any excuse. You know, they get out and a lot of these people really, because they they looked a part of this disabled. And I'm like, who am I to complain? I'm not going to file a claim. I did that for 11 years. Just make excuses not to file a claim because I felt that I was at least better off than them. So, Well, that's where people sometimes fail to understand 
all disabilities are not visible. Exactly. I, I have those conversations. I mean, constantly. I mean, I've had people approach me because I have a veteran tag. And you get the look, you get them thinking, you know, I just developed the tagline. Hold on. It ain't visible. Right. <laughs> no, that is real, though. Right. And you keep pressing me, you finna be introduced to it. So right. <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> like, um, but that's just it. It's the stigma that right. has created, it's caused shame, it's made you silent, and it makes you stuck. <laughs> that's why the relationship, divorce rate, separation rates are so high among military members. You were you left your loved one 100%. You came back 40 or 50%. That other 50% you may never find again, but that loved one is looking for the same 100% they sent away. And you don't have, at that point, until we started talking here recently, we didn't have the skill set. We didn't have the tools. We were not made to feel it was okay to tell someone. I've experienced violations. Uh, you, you, you think that I was in Desert Storm with however many hundreds of people and something didn't happen? As a woman with men, you had the, the, the military had the don't ask, don't tell. You had officers just running amok, taking advantage. And as that enlisted, you didn't feel that you had a voice. You didn't feel like you had a, a platform that you could say something's wrong. So to your point, we did not have the freedom of speech that we felt it was safe. And that's really what it comes down to. These groups that um, they are hosting meetings now and you go to these and you and, and Finally, they created a platform where you got like-minded people who dealt with like stuff that you all speak in the same language. Well, that's we were patronized for a bit because finally just to be able to talk about it. I would say, now what? Now what's next? You got a group of people sitting around meeting every week telling the same old stories. <laughs> what's moving this ball down the field? Where are the measurable results of change? So it's almost like you just created a, a glee club for us and we come together in our kumbaya moment. Anthony, you got put out because, again, you weren't singing the right verse. You want to tell the truth. And they're like, now we ain't right. we're not here for that. So even still, and what is supposed to be something to make us better is still controlled. Um, it's still the, a, a created narrative. So all around the country... These group meetings are happening, but our end results are still the same. You've got people that still have not been able to get to the core of things that are creating daily impact to themselves, to their family, to their loved ones, on their jobs. You know, no employees are quit for somebody that just came back, they ain't quite right, came back 40%. Like I said, those who are quiet, I mean, that became part of my uh, I guess discernment. When I'm in a room, I want to know who ain't talking, right. who who looks irritated. Right. That's how I befriended Dennis so quickly. I right. want to say, just let me know today is not a good day to come to work. Right. <laughs> cool. <laughs> right. But we 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 take these things for granted and we overlook signs that are right in front of us, but, and then we write people off as. Oh man, you know they're temperamental. <laughs> Got a bad temp bad attitude. <laughs> you you don't know what I'm dealing with. Well, you know, I think that you know, Sonia, when you mentioned the the taboo associated with with the whole mental health thing and the stigma, shame and so forth, what's funny is I recall sitting in front of a mental health professional who was looking me in my face and treating me and I'm still in denial. Like, uh uh, no, not not the kid. Uh uh. You you know what I mean? <laughs> You know, do you know what title I had? You know, I mean, I was, I was up, I was like, I can't. It was, it was more, I cannot have this going on with me. My, my job is to be a certain person and, and, and operate at a certain level. I cannot do this. I can't do this with you. And the dude was like, okay, call it what you want. Uh, meanwhile, take these. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, so now, you know they would sedate you in a minute. But it's, right. it right. was, what would they and them say? That, that right. was really where our accountability, because many of us who right. came out and went on to become successful in our professional role, we got to push this stuff down and behind us. We never dealt with it. So our title became the mask. Our accomplishment became the mask 
that allowed us to um, feel successful because no one knew our secrets. Right. So, you know, like you said, and the solution was, well, let's try this combination. I mean, I, I can remember being at the VA and people come in all hyped and they're making a whole lot of noise. And uh, some folks come out, pick them up on their arms, walk them to the back and they come back put them in a chair and they're looking out the window counting daffodils and daisies. So it's like, man, what did they give them? Calm so, all the way down. Right. All the way down, right? Oh. <laughs> I'm like, you ain't no trouble to nobody in the world. And that for so long became the solution. So now you created another problem. Look at the people who created dependencies on these drugs. And then you had these pill pushers that, again, they would just change up the combination. Right. I mean, I had something they said I had insomnia as a part of PTSD, and I took it on a Friday. On Saturday, all I could do was lay there, open my eyes, and wait on the next wave of sleep to come and take me back under. Right. I'm like, uh, I didn't have a sleep deficit after that weekend, let's just say right. that. But <laughs> again, we're masking the real problems. We, 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 we scrape the surface. They're throwing money at solutions, but there's still not the right combination of things that are really making people better. Right. And, and I look at it this way, too. Uh, y'all, y'all said some things that that's really, you know, just key to what's going on, especially in the black community or the, you know, in our community. You're talking about veterans that, OK, there's always this stigma. You know, if you're a soldier, you don't complain. Right. So we all we all had that. I don't care what branch you was in. You know, if you're a soldier, you don't do a lot of complaining. You you know, you you know, we call it FIDO. You know what FIDO? Everybody know what FIDO means. Right. You know, effort and drive on. So so that's what that's the attitude you're taking. So we were built not to complain. So for a lot of soldiers who didn't actually retire from the military, especially soldiers of color, when we came home, we still got that mentality. And and I mean, I know we was we were suffering through so much. I know me personally, I was suffering through so much. I mean Everybody was like, why are you snoring so much? You, you 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 can't, you know, sleep outside. I mean, my my wife, my family was like, this is ridiculous. I didn't know anything about sleep apnea, but it was out there with all these, uh, like I said, the itching spells, the swelling spells. I didn't know that that would have been something associated with uh, Gulf War exposures, but it was out there. The information was out there, but, but it wasn't disseminated to me that way. And, the, and then the problem is when I went to the VA and explained everything that was going on with me, my skin is overreacting. I can't sleep. I'm having these swelling and itching spells. My joints are hurting. The only thing they would do is try to give me some, some medication for it. Mm-hmm. Instead of telling me this is what this probably mm-hmm. is. They're, they're, they're not trying to align it to anything. They're trying to make sure, okay, well, we'll try to treat you for what you're saying. It, But it's like shush, shush, shush on the Mm-hmm. on the compensation side about what it could truly be. And 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 like I said, you're going we going for years with that. So I think that most veterans, veterans of color that didn't re- that didn't retire from the military, I know that it probably took them 10 years to at least file a claim. Mm-hmm. Average 10 years. When the other our counterparts, if they didn't retire you when they got out, they were filing a claim within one or two years. Right. Because they, they they stumped their toe. But think about the doctors who were treating the vets right. who had participated in these wars. They never saw war. They never right. saw the, the chemical reactions. Right. So you had, to me, a ill-prepared body of people who had the fate of your claim, the fate of your health in their hands, but they did not have the exposure or experience to properly treat. The self-medication piece is what a lot of vets, when you get the use of drugs, the use of alcohol, the use of cigarettes, the use of pot. So many vets just found a way to cope because they did not have the resources that understood when they sat before them, you know, say, I feel like there's something under my skin. If you've ever had sand fleas, mm-hmm. okay. yes. Um, yes. if you ever had a bout with that, yes, I have. mentally, your mind tells you that something is constantly moving under your skin. Right. So many soldiers um, or veterans have dealt with things that were more mental, but no one could explain it. Right. It's almost like penicillin. Penicillin right. is a known antibiotic that should knock anything down. Just take these. So they weren't specific to what people were really dealing so, with. Right. It was generic approach. Like I said, to, to, 
to serve the mass and just quiet the complaint. So if you can knock down the problem, not fix it, just knock it down where it's not getting that much attention. I experienced this sort of push-pull tug of war with the mental health professionals, meaning I'm pushing. No, I do not have that. They're pulling. Yes, you do. Okay. Now I'm pulling. Well, make it plain. Put it in plain English so you can tell me what this is. Now they're pushing. Uh Uh-uh, we can't do that. Take this. (laughs) Right? So it's like, and, and what I found out later was that it's what you were saying earlier about, how, how did you put it, sort of this uh, uh, develop to deny. Mm-hmm. You are treating me and you are saying that this is what it is, but you're not saying that this is what it is. Right. Because. When you put it in writing. I'm not. <laughs> right. And so the and, and so the way it was put to me, the mere fact that you're in this special program says that you have this. I was like, well, no, 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 that, that's not a, uh-uh. no, I need you to write that out for me. Yeah, right. Because if I'm asking you a direct question, verbally, you'll say, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. But when I look in the paperwork, I don't see nothing about PTSD and all this other stuff. And they're saying, no, you're in this program that treats hmm. PTSD. Well, do I have it or do I not? Right. And it wasn't until, it wasn't until I got with someone who finally was just cool and was like, oh yeah, you do. Let me write this in here or whatever. And mind you, now I, uh, what I understood it to be was that they have experienced such an influx of people who come there specifically to file claims and not mm. get treated. Mm. Right. They dumped me in this bucket right. thinking that I was there for a claim. And I didn't even know how to spell claim at the mm-hmm. time. Right? I didn't go down there. Like, I didn't even know how the VA worked. I wasn't about claims and all this. I just took the advice of someone who said, go talk. <laughs> Go see somebody. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not in here about claims and all this. So there was this. There was this. We going We going We gonna treat you with a ten foot pole. We're gonna make sure that documentation says we are treating this veteran, but they won't say what the veteran has. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. So so there's this push and pull, and then finally, again, I just I'm lucky. I I'm blessed. Mm-hmm. I understand that because someone in the VA said, "Here's what it is. Here's what you need to go do." And that's when my claim process started. I didn't do that on my, I didn't go into it thinking claims. So again, it goes back to that dissemination. And I know, I recognize that I am one of the yes, lucky ones yes. who ran into somebody who finally who cared, said, who cared, you, who cared. Who, they cared. They cared. Absolutely. And that's they what cared. it comes down to. And they, yeah, absolutely. But, that's what it was. But you also have, during that push where they were just bringing the vets in to get them off the street, because local municipalities were locking people up who had real problems created by the military and saying, let's give them a place that they can kind of talk it out. So out of you know them wanting to take the negative stigma, because um, like I know one of the local sheriffs, he has created a in-house program that if he has an inmate that is a vet, you know, he's reaching out to the VA trying to find out. Before that vet goes before a judge and gets a sentence that's not necessarily warranted, but it's it's the the, the behavior is as a result of uh, they should have been in treatment. So you, I mean, you had a jail full of people who, again, uh, where a percentage of them really should have been in therapy, opposed to be in jail. So uh, I, I think the military does enough to mask the problems, to save face, and give the appearance that they are doing things to protect a service member who's now a veteran who has made the sacrifice to serve their country. You look at the the cases right now, Camp Lejeune, how many years did they have a known issue with water, but they never gave it a name? And now all of a sudden, they're looking for anyone who's impacted. I find that the military is never proactive, but reactive. And what people need now may not happen for another Five or ten years. Yeah, it may not happen. Uh, and, and oh, may just not. To come, right, just to go with what you're saying, even with the, uh, I was getting ready to talk about the PAC Act, but let's, even with the uh, Camp Lejeune effect, with the uh, exposures through the water, okay, those are supposed to be presumptive disorders, but most of them are cancers. You know, everybody didn't get a cancer, but they probably got something that affected, you know, them in their body. So it's hard to prove that claim. And mm-hmm. this is what's happening now. What's happening now is uh, you could file a claim with the VA and try to get justice, 
but it's, you're still going to be hard pressed because the VA is asking for things that they shouldn't ask for by being presumptive in nature. Presumptive in nature means if you're diagnosed with something that's readily that they say that is a presumption, you, you don't need any evidence. You just, they're going to compensate you. That's not the case. It's not going to happen that way. So now what's going on with is, is all of these, uh, these law groups yep. are getting into the field of where they're asking you to join their class action. And I mm-hmm. tell people, how much company, how much money do you think you're going to get in a class action? It only takes 40 people to start a class action. You got about, I'm going to say at least five or six different uh, law firms. And what's going to happen is when that judge comes back with a number or they finally come back with a number and say, OK, uh, what normally happens? Let's say they come back and say, we're going to say 300 million. Those attorneys are going to get 40 percent. So what the, what the judge would do is like we're not going to adjudicate every one of these separate lawsuits with these separate attorney, uh, these different law groups. We're going to we're going to make y'all combine together. So these these you'll see once it start happening, these groups going to start coming more together. The same with earplugs. It ain't no different. Mm-hmm. They're going right. to start coming together. They're going to join. So if it's if it's six different law groups, they're going to come together as one. They're going to agree on the 40 percent payout of the maximum money. And then all the people who file a claim get the rest. So I said, you may end up getting $3.30. You got $3.30 cents. Cents on a claim on <laughs> something. Now you can't even go back and file a claim. <laughs> right. You can't exactly. even file a claim on it because right. you have been it's a part settled. of this class action. Yep. And, and, and this is what they're asking you to do. And it's no different from what's going to happen with the PAC Act. It's the same right. thing. They're going to set it up that way. And, and the problem is, if you try to go at it alone, the VA just came down the pipe with three changes that they want to make uh, in their scheduled rating. And they want to change the way they do sleep apnea business. So it's, you're going to be hard pressed to get a sleep apnea claim through in the next, I say, six months. You're mm-hmm. going to be hard pressed because of what you have to go through now. It's not as easy. The law, if they if they get this approved and they get this new addendum in the law, you're going to have to go through so many different functionality tests to say is your sleep apnea really really worth compensating? They changed the way that they're adjudicating respiratory disorders down the line. So people that's now that that has to have oxygen to breathe, the VA said we want to take their hundred percent rating because we don't we don't agree that just because they need oxygen to breathe that they should be a hundred percent. Like are you serious? So the VA want to take this compensation mm. from people. So it's all they, they are actually going out of their way and they're 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 making it sound like it's for veterans, but nothing in this is for veterans. So they got three three disorders. The other one is uh is for the ear, nose, and throat. I think they want to take the uh they want to take the I think the ear out of it. I mean, so they want to they want to make it ear, nose, and throat instead of just separate cyanitis and tinnitus. They want to combine them. That may be more in favor mm. for the veterans because it's only ten percent, but the other two. Veterans finna get penalized real hard. And I tell people, the way they got it in the language, it don't matter if you got a sleep apnea claim in now. Because the the law doesn't, they could easily say that if you now, if you have a sleep apnea claim p- uh, pending, or you're already getting compensated, you won't be affected. The law says, if you have a, if you're getting compensated for sleep apnea uh, claim right now, it won't affect you. That doesn't mean that it's not going to affect pending. So they know that all these claims they got sitting mm. right now, mm. you're going to be left dis- disenfranchised by this new law. Now they don't have to pay all this money up. Now you think about what you just said, and you go back to the beginning of the conversation. Knowledge is power. How many vets have not heard that? Will not know because they won't make a public service announcement. They'll no. just make that adjustment in that check. And then that's, then that's when we are busy making the phone call, what happened? And somebody will be on the other line saying, well, what had happened was they were talking about this for some period of time and right. it passed and the adjustments have now been made. Right. So what you just described is such a classic example of how so many of us are reactionary and, or we're looking to how do I circumvent the process? Because again, they don't play fair either. Right, not at all. Well, we've been at this. Can you believe it? Time flies. It's been we've been at this for a while now, right? This this conversation. So, I want to end on this. What advice would you give someone who may not be a veteran in order for them to have a more positive interaction with veterans of color? Given everything we've talked about, all the experiences and everything that we're going through, what advice would you give them in order to have that positive interaction? Or is there anything that you <laughs> oh, can tell? Oh, sure. <laughs> Um, well, what I what I would say is for uh, for non veterans, you, you have to be able to uh, have perspective taking 
and uh, emp empathy thinking. So, so under perspective taking, you have to be able to look outside of yourself and see other situations. And and through through empathy, you have to empathize with things that may not necessarily be something that you suffer from, but realize that other people do. So I think it's more perspective taking and empathy uh, thinking, you know, to, to be able to, to, to bring that together and rationalize and, you know, and not just look at it as someone's making excuses, especially when it's, uh, uh, when it's uh, unseen disabilities. Right. You know, those unseen disabilities in people, you know, people tend to judge you a different way. You know, they want you to be jacked up. They want you to, you know, they want you to roll yourself in before they give you respect. Oh, I'm going to respect you if you rolled yourself in or you limp mm -hmm. in, you know, you know, show, show me your crib walk before I should give you some respect. <laughs> but but no, so that's it. I, I would just say perspective taking, having a better perspective taking and practicing uh, empathy, having empathy mm -hmm. thinking, you know, that, that that's what I would say. I Okay. would say if you start with the benefit of the doubt, what you've done is you've leveled the playing field. That means you're going to give me an opportunity for whatever my truth is to be present without judgment, without prejudice. The benefit of the doubt is nothing more than just, I'm going to give this next person grace. Right. PTSD is not a visible disorder. And when people say, well, you're always uptight, you're angry. Well, that, that's that judgment that sometimes goes before you give, before giving another person just grace. And when you don't know, you know, education is paramount. Uh, I say my PTSD is not anger. I'm just pissed off and it's called pissivity. And if you poke the bear, she gets more pissed off. So grace though, <laughs> when you offer the benefit of the doubt, you're offering grace. When you offer educate, when someone said, well, help me understand, you know, what, 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 what do you think? What are your triggers? You can appreciate a person wanting to understand, you know, become more educated about something opposed to right off the rip. Oh, right. they're a tough one to work with. They got a bad attitude. Those on those roundtable evaluation, when you're on a job and they're trying to rank their people, you know how many people are denied a fair shake because they're dealing with a real disability that someone is dressing it as just a personality, a bad attitude. Right. Now you're messing with someone's money, but you don't even understand. So I would say always, if, at all costs, give the benefit of the doubt. Approach it from help me understand. Um, you'd be surprised how prepared people are to share their truth. So it takes away the stigma that you might just assign to them. Well, I think those are awesome words. And I, I think the only thing that I would add is that if people would just remember, I like I heard this saying that says, love looks through a telescope, hate looks through a microscope. Hmm. Right. Oh. Wow. Yeah. And I think it's good. I think there's a lot of hate out there. And when we just being who we are, I think we're always under a microscope. Right. I think that when people hear the word veteran, they, they there's a, an expectation. Then when they look at you and see what you look like and then add the word veteran, there's even mm. more of an expectation. Then when they right. look at you, add the word veteran and then find out that you might have one of these unseen disabilities. There's even more right. of an expectation. Right. And through that microscope, if you do not meet those expectations, mm -hmm. then you get treated a certain way. Right. And I say back up look through the telescope and look at me as a whole. Right. And I don't know too many people that you can look through a microscope at and not find some things. Right. right. Absolutely. No matter veteran or not. Right. Exactly. Right? So anyway, so we're going to wrap up there and I'm going to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this discussion. I really oh. appreciate you guys, yes. man. Now, thank is, you for the platform. This has been thank awesome. Thank you for the yeah, platform. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. And anytime, anytime, I, I look, I know that a B, uh, zone three, zone three, a B has a, has a podcast coming out soon. Your claim to fame, right? Yeah. Yeah. But with Miss Sonia. So, Hey, I mean, we, we getting ready to do some big things. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, so oh, Miss Sonia's a part of that thing. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, uh, we got a three headed monster. All and, right. Uh, <laughs> we, we we coming out and we want to make it fun we want to make it to where uh we want this thing to be a uplifting morning show we want to give uh veterans who who feel like the process for them is over or it's not even worth it 
We want to make them smile when they hear us. We want to make them feel empowered. We want to let them know that real help is out there. We're going to be coming with uh, guests that, that actually do real work inside mm-hmm. of the government. These agencies, uh, nonprofits, uh, private organizations that actually do real work for veterans, that, that actually give support. So we're not, we, we want to not only, you know, talk to walk, you know, mm-hmm. we want to walk it. We want to talk to talk. We want to walk the walk. Awesome. And we're going to actually awesome. we'll make it fun. We're going to make it fun. And being a part of a connectional body, I just believe that the stronger the village in any forum, the more effective we all become. We all grow. When you started this, Dennis, uh, it was like so needed. And I mean, you know, the, the topics, the message, the, the information. Anthony's about to do, you know, he's going to take this leg up and, you know, put a spin and a twist on it. So I just believe that the bigger the village we can create, the more impactful our message will be and the more helpful we become as good stewards, just Absolutely. given the platform to, again, to continue this service. And that's what we were built to do. We're here to serve. Awesome. Absolutely. Well, listen, I wish you guys much success. I know it's going to be awesome. I am so looking forward to what, uh, Scheduled date for release when you when you coming out with it? Uh, tentative. <laughs> tentative October the twenty fourth. Okay. So that's the date that's uh, been assigned. We also uh, okay. we're going to be hosting from Clayton State University down in the vet center. So wow. you know we want to we want to <laughs> keep that uh, we want to keep it about veterans. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of younger veterans there, but we have some uh, what we call non traditional veterans that want to be a part. Uh, but we got some other things coming down the line. We got, uh, you know, everything goes well. Hopefully in the spring we'll be doing a campus road march where we'll, we'll be going to different colleges to their veteran pro- programs. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be uh, hosting from there. Uh, some other things that we, we got hopefully coming on down the pipe. Anthony, but, we, but it's going to be it's going to be fun. Can you give the shout out for this upcoming uh, veteran event that I think would be beneficial? Uh, August, is it October 22nd? Uh, yeah, vet, vet yeah. Fest? So, I, I, yes, October the twenty second uh, is the vet fest. I don't have the information in front of me, uh, but I did pass it along to uh, the Rose. Okay. But it's the uh, the vet fest. It does a couple of different uh, uh, programs that they have uh, that's spinning off from there. They had a car show a couple of weeks ago. This, I, I think, this open house is the twenty. Uh, this open. This open gathering is on the twenty second. Then they have a women's conference right. conference in November. So I would I don't I don't actually have the information in front. Okay. But uh, well, luckily I do. Okay. So the Vet Fest is happening at Star Park in Forest Park on October twenty second from twelve p.m. to six p.m. So we're hoping that everyone comes out and supports the Vet Fest. It's V E T F E S T Vet Fest. That will be at Star Park in Forest Park on October 22nd from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Hopefully everyone will come out and support the veterans. Yeah, shout out to Mr. Leonard, uh, the organizer. Mr. Leonard, he's a veteran. Uh, yes, he also has a, uh, a veteran uh, housing program, and he, he does great work for veterans as well. Uh, we wanted to get him on today to speak about it. He just has some, uh, some other appointments and you know things that he had already agreed upon to, to do today but uh mr leonard uh, yes mr leonard is the organizer okay well and also as always keep me posted on whatever you have going on i will definitely put the word out there and promote what you have and um with that said we will go ahead and bring this to an end listen may god keep you may god bless you and may god continue to be with you, you guys take, take care. care thank you, thank you.